All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, tonight for tonight's conversation, for our discussion, we are going to be doing a little history tonight. We're going to be doing a little Buddhist history. And it's funny, I was trying to think how to introduce this, and this is it, this dawned on me right before uh, just a little, little while ago. So, you know, I've been doing this series for the Dharma Doors where we've, we've been talking about upaya and or skillful means. And we've been reading this sutra uh, from this yellow book from the Treasury of Mahayana Sutras. We've been reading the uh, upaya sutra. And last week, the topic that I had for the Dharma Doors was uh, the Bodhisattva's Guide to Harmonious Relationships. And we spent the evening talking about the four means of unification, which are these four practices of generosity, kind speech, volunteerism, and cooperation. And these are the four means by which bodhisattvas create harmonious relationships or the way that a bodhisattva even acts as a uh, peacemaker, the way that they go into situations where there's problems and they create harmony. <clears throat> so last week was all about harmonious relationships. <laughs> well, I realized that the, the little talk that I have prepared, at least for the beginning of tonight, it's kind of the Bodhisattva's guide to schisms, uh, to non-harmonious relationships. And I, I only say that in, in joking, but what we're going to be talking about tonight, like I said, we're going to be talking about some Buddhist history, and we're going to be talking about some different schools of early Buddhism very early Buddhism. And because of what is um, about to happen in our sutra, because of where we're going, I kind of need to tell you all of this backstory so that this sort of makes a, a little bit of sense in that way. So what we're going to be talking about, well, the story that I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you kind of a long story and this is the story of the first three councils. So you may know, but you might not know, that throughout the history of Buddhism, there have been many uh, um, councils, they're called, these gatherings of Buddhists. And there's been many of them, actually, but I'm only, I'm only going to talk about the first three tonight. And... I do have some, some information on my whiteboard, but I'm going to ease us into that. I, I don't want to like lay too much on you at once. So the first thing that I want to, well, let's talk about the first council. I think that's an easy place to start. So the first council was a gathering of Buddhists, a gathering of followers of the Buddha, that occurred pretty much right after he passed away. Now, let's, again, I'm going to just kind of like, I don't want to presume too much or too little in that way. So just to orient ourselves, it is generally understood, broadly generally understood, that the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, who became a Buddha known as Shakyamuni, this person or this Buddha is said to have passed away or entered Parinirvana around the year 400 BC or BCE, depending on which dating system you like to use. Now, we also understand that the Buddha lived until he was 80 years old, which would mean that the Buddha was probably born around. 480 BC, <laughs> that was a long time ago, lived for 80 years, and then 
around the year 400 BC passed away, <clears throat> and most scholars attribute the first council to the year 400 BC. Now, what happened at that first council, and I've actually, it's funny, I just realized, we've already talked a little bit about this, because last week, we were introduced to, um, yeah, I think it was last week that we were introduced to uh, Kashyapya, this monk who, as I mentioned last week, it is this monk named Kashyapya who was the overseer of the first council. And basically, the first council was called in order to establish what the teachings are, to establish what the monastic code or the monastic discipline was, and basically to establish what the Dharma was. What is it that we are doing here as Buddhists in that way? And so <clears throat> Kashyapya called together what who, who are known as the 500 Arahats. So these were the 500 most you know, advanced, most pure practitioners of Buddhism at the time of the Buddha. The 500 arhats were the only people that were invited to the first council. And interestingly, there was a monk named Upali, who at the first council is the one who stood up and said, oh, I remember all the monastic code called the, the Vinaya. Oh, I remember all of the Vinaya, Upali said. I remember all of the rules that the Buddha established for the monks and nuns. And he said, I remember all of the backstories explaining why the Buddha made that a rule. And so at the first council, Upali rattled off all of the rules, and Kashapya stamped them with the sign of approval. These are the rules. Then what's interesting, and I'll tell you a little side story. One of the funny little side stories is that when it came to the sutras, when it came to the actual teachings of the Buddha, some of the monks remembered some of the sutra uh, discourses, some other monks remembered other discourses. So Upali established the code, but not everybody could remember all of the teachings. But there was one monk who did remember all of the teachings, and this was the Buddha's young cousin, Ananda. And Ananda, it's funny because Ananda wasn't invited to the party. Ananda wasn't in, was not considered an arahat, and so he wasn't invited to the party or to the first council. But what happened was, is that he wanted to go, and he needed to prove that he was an arahat. He wanted to prove that he could be allowed in. And so the story is, is that there was a little uh, knot hole, like a little peephole in the door the entryway to the first council. And supposedly Ananda performed one of the Siddhis, one of the miraculous powers and shrunk himself down and popped through the little knot hole and then grew back to normal size. And everybody was like, whoa, Ananda, you, you, you did it. You made it to the level of an Arhat. And so then Ananda recited all of the sutras Thus have I heard, the Buddha was at such and such a place, and so all of the sutras got recorded. And then there was another monk, a famous monk we've talked about named Shariputra, and Shariputra remembered all of the Buddha's analysis of the Dharma. It's called the Abhidharma. So all of the Buddha's like teachings about what the Dharma really means, like the analysis, the Abhidharma was all Shariputra. So those were sort of our main sort of spokespeople at the first council. 
And again, Kashyapya kind of running the council, but not necessarily the leader in that way. <clears throat> now, I tell you all of this backstory about the first council because everything seems to have been fine during the first council and far as that there was there was there was a, agreement among everybody that these were the rules are there was agreement among everyone that this is what the sutras are there was agreement among everybody that this is what the abhidharma is and so there was there was unity and harmony among the sangha and if now remember, this was in the year 400 BC. So it seems that everything was going along fine in the world of Buddhism until the year 300 BC. So remember, we're in BC land before the common era. So time is moving, you know, the numbers are moving the other way. So we've moved from 400 BC to 300 BC. And it was at 300, during around the year 300 BC, that there started to be a schism. This was the first internal dispute among the Buddhists. And so a council was called in order to set the record straight. So again, this was in the year 300 BC. And the primary division at the first council and now I will show you my chart a little bit. So we've got uh, 400 BC, the first council of 500 Arhats. 300 BC, the second council, which was a split between a group known as the Maha Samgikas and the Staviras, the elders. Now, I'm going to talk about this division really quickly. I'm not going to hold the whiteboard up. So Mahasamgikas versus the Staviras, the elders. Now, the first thing I want to say for anybody out there who has studied your Buddhist history, this second council that's split between the Mahasamgikas and the Staviras, even though the Staviras were known as the elders, the, this is not the Theravadins. This is not the elders, the way of the elders that might you might know of. This was a split between <clears throat> these very old forms of Buddhism. So what you should know, one thing that every kind of student of Buddhism should know is that at after a hundred years, and in the year 300 BC, the mainstream form of Buddhism, like that, you know, it, it was Buddhism. It's, it, you know, what the initial council of the 500 Arhats and Ananda, that mainstream group of Buddhism, by the year 300 BC, they were known as the Maha Sanghikas, the great Sangha, the Maha Sanghika. And what happened was, is that, well, it seems, and this is what's great about history, is we can kind of deduce a few things, but during that hundred year period between the, the death of the founder, the death of the Buddha, and this second council, so that during that hundred year period, Buddhism seems to have gotten very popular because the Maha Samgikas, they were everywhere, they, meaning they had spread pretty far throughout the subcontinent of India. And some of those groups in more kind of far-reaching areas, well, some thought that they were sort of getting a little lax in their practice. And so what happened was, is that there was a group of elders, and there was one monk in particular who was like the leader of this group. And they basically caused a stink. <laughs> they caused a big uh, kerfuffle, if you will. And what happens is, is that they actually, the Staviras, 
the these elders in and and it was one elder in particular who was accused of rearranging and kind of altering the vinaya the vinaya that was established at the first council this elder rearranged it in a certain way i was i was trying to do more research into exactly what happened but it seems that he did this thing and changed the vinaya in order to say, you guys are breaking the rules. But these Mahasamgikas, they were like, we're not breaking the rules. We're doing the same thing we've been doing for the last hundred years. You are the ones that are actually trying to meddle with, and this was the, um, the catchphrase. The catchphrase was that they were trying to meddle or change the Vinaya as Kashapya had approved it. The Kashapya put the stamp of approval and said, yep, this is what the Buddha said we were to observe and to do. And so even though the elders, these Staviras, which were a small group, by the way, it sounds like they were a, a, a minority. They were the ones who were actually seemingly changing things, not the Mahasamgikas. The Mahasamgikas were keeping things status quo and so the staviras broke off now what this points to though is this points to future schisms in the sangha and it will point to more progressive forms of buddhism versus more conservative forms of buddhism so the staviras we're trying seemingly to preserve a sense of uh, tradition or a like, because again, their accusation was that some of the Mahasamgika people were getting too lax and they didn't think it, they didn't see it that way. They saw it as kind of adapting to the cultures or these different regions where they were being practiced. So that's the second council. Now, the thing that I want to make really clear before we get to the third council, where things get even more interesting, I want to make it really clear that the time period that we're talking about, 400 BC, 300 BC, and now we're about to move forward to 250 BC. That's the date for the third council, 250 BC. I want you to know that this whole... 250 year time period that we're talking about and this will go on for about another 100 years or so so the first 300 350 years of buddhist history all of these groups the mahasamgikas the staviras and the the groups i'm about to talk about these are all what are called hinayana these are all very austere, monastic, celibate uh, organizations or traditions. Nobody, nobody up till the second council in the year 300, everybody was practicing celibacy, poverty, homelessness, wandering, like all of the hallmarks of early Buddhism. So they were all Hinayana. Even moving up to the third council, all Hinayana. And what this period is called, by the way, so this kind of early period of Buddhist history from around, you know, after the life of the Buddha up until about 300 BC or 250 BC, this whole period is called the period of the 18 schools. Now, is, this is called the period of the 18 schools, but again, these are 18 forms of Hinayana Buddhism, 18 different groups, all practicing celibacy, poverty, homelessness, and so on. But among these Hinayana groups, things started to get even more divided, and that leads us up to the year 250 BC. So, 250 BC in India is what is called the Ashokan period. 
because the emperor at that time, who would be the emperor of India for a while, was this person, Emperor Ashoka, the first uh, warrior, the first uh, person to unify the subcontinent of India, to unify it as one nation, one empire under Ashoka. And Ashoka, if you didn't know, was famously or famously converted to Buddhism. He wasn't a Buddhist. He led a kind of pretty bloody uh, campaign, a war to unite all of India. And then after all of that was over, seemingly to kind of wash his hands of all the blood, he converted to Buddhism and began sort of, um, well, supporting the Sangha. And this is what we know of Ashoka, is that he became kind of a devotee of the Dharma <clears throat> and supported various Sanghas. He did something else too that I'll tell you about in a second. He did it a little bit later after the first or after the third council. But it was during this period of Ashoka that something happened. So, and this, by the way, this, what I'm about to tell you about happens in China when Buddhism goes there. It happens in Japan when Buddhism goes there. It, this pattern happens a lot. And what it is, is that Emperor Ashoka rises to prominence, begins to support the Sangha, like all of these Buddhist organizations. And so the Buddhist organizations are uh, flush. <laughs> they, they are well-funded now because they are basically like a nationally supported, or an, I should say imperially supported organization. So what happens is, is that within a kind of, um, and this is, by the way, this is all historical speculation based on records. Please don't take anything I'm saying as fact in that way. But this is what the record suggests. That because the, the Sanghas were all being so well supported, it seemed that a lot of people started to become monastics but not with the purest of intentions, meaning they were joining because it was a, uh, a place to sleep, a place to eat, free clothes, and kind of it was like an easier lifestyle than you might find out on the streets. So people started joining the monasteries and becoming Buddhist, but not necessarily to get enlightened and end their suffering. <clears throat> It also seems, there's a lot to this third council, it also seems that if you're familiar with the Hinayana, the early Buddhist um, system by which when you first enter, you're known as a stream enterer, and then if you do enough practice, you could be dubbed a once returner. But if you do it even, if you do even more practice and are recognized, you could be a non-returner. And then you could get recognized as an arhat, a fully enlightened one. And these titles, the title of stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, arhat, these titles were like given by elders, by the sangha, and then people were recognized as these different, and there were um, qualifications there were certain qualifications that you had to meet in order to be recognized as these things. What seems to have happened is, is that part of the problem that led to the third council in the year 250 BC is that there were people who were being elevated up to these higher levels, but who seemingly didn't have the qualities or the, the, the criteria to be called that. So it seems that the organization of Buddhism was getting very political in that way. And again, this happens in China that once Buddhism becomes part of Chinese culture and becomes officially uh, recognized, people start joining the Buddhist monasteries in order to avoid taxes, in order to avoid going to the military, in, or, uh, in order to avoid conscription, 
So this happens a lot with Buddhism, that it gets kind of political. It happened in India. And so Ashoka called a third council to clear this out. So the third council wasn't so much about a schism. It wasn't so much about two different groups debating about what the Buddha really said or what the Dharma really was. The third council was about complaints by the public, by everybody, that the whole Sangha had just gotten kind of corrupt and needed clearing out. So they call this third council and they basically have these uh, really, really respected theras, as they're called, elders, they're theras. So these really old, respected elders basically like pulled out the ancient records, pulled out the original kind of teachings and kind of actually went around qu quizzing people. It was kind of, I hadn't thought about it like this, but it was kind of an inquisition in, in the you know true uh, meaning of that word where the Catholics went around kind of interrogating people's uh, discipline in that way. Hello? Sorry, one second. So there was this kind of Buddhist inquisition under Ashoka, and it's because of this inquisition that I'll use that in quotes. It was because of this that we actually have a lot of information about the state of Buddhism in the year 250 BC, because people were keeping records about all the different groups that were in attendance, what their beliefs were, what their doctrines were, what made them different. And so that's where I kind of really want to spend a little bit of time uh, and to get us back to the sutra. I want to tell you a, a little bit about some of these uh, early schools of Buddhism. There's one school in particular that I want to tell you about. So here we have the third council, 250 BC. And I wanna talk about this group. So this group is known as the Lokotara Vadins. So this uh, suffix, the Vada, like a Theravada, which you might know the Theravada or Theravadins. So a Vada, just means like the the way or the path, the path of the elders or the way of the elders. That's what Thera Vada means. And by the way, it's at the third council that the Theravadins kind of start to move in their own direction. But this group is the Lokot Tada Vadins. So the way of Lokotara. What does Lokotara mean, you may ask? <laughs> so Lokotara means, well, it would be translated as uh, super mundane, uh, otherworldly, transcendent. It actually, literally Lokotara means out of this world. <laughs> and the, the root of that word is loka, loko, loka. And loko is this word for sort of the, the world. It's actually where we, we get the English word local, locate, locale, any of these words that indicate a place in English that begin with L-O-C, like location, that lok, location, local. The lok comes from Sanskrit, and it means an area, a region, a locale. But it also sort of indicates the earth or the world. And then lokotada actually means above, above the world. So that's where a good translation is transcendent 
in that way. So what were the Lokotara? What were the Lokotara Vadins? What were they all about? Well, what, first thing before I kind of tell you about out of this worldness, I want to make it really clear that that mainstream form of Buddhism that started at the first council with the 500 arhats, remember it was called the Mahasamgikas, they were the Sangha. When you get to the year 250 BC to the third council, the Lokotaravadins that I, I want to tell you about, they're basically Mahasamgikas. It's just a sort of a different name for us, the Mahasamgikas. They have even yet another name, and I know we're getting complicated with the names, but they're called the Ekavya, Ekavya Vaharikas. <laughs> it's another name for them. So what do they all believe? So this is the thing that I wanted to talk about tonight. This is very, a very long introduction to the actual topic tonight. So this book, which is where I'm getting a lot of my information tonight, The Buddhist Schools of the Small Vehicle by this guy, Alain or Andre Barreau not the French, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. So this was translated into English not too long ago, but it's a pretty old, famous piece of scholarship on the 18 schools. It's a great book if you're interested in this stuff, by the way. Basically, it's just a chapter per school and everything that we know about them. It's, or, you know, not everything, but most of what we know about them. So it's a great resource. And if you were to go... Two, chapter six on the Lokotara Vadins. He has a list of their primary doctrines, like their primary teachings. And he does this, by the way, for almost all of the original 18 schools. And then what this book does is basically compare them all to notice how they're slightly different. But I want you to know that the Mahasamgikas, the mainstream form of Buddhism, who are represented by these Lokataravadins, they all have <clears throat> this same teaching. They all have this same idea. Number one, that the Buddha that Buddhas are Lokotara, <laughs> that Buddhas are transcendental, that Buddhas are out of this world. Actually, I'll, I'll read to you. I'm going to actually go to <clears throat> chapter five, which is on the Mahasamgikas. Their teaching regarding this says... Where'd you go? So also their first doctrine, their first principle teaching is that Buddhas are Lokotara. Buddhas are out of this world. They're transcendental. And then the description of this is this. I'll read this for you. The body of the Buddhas is entirely transcendent since it is unsurpassable and is completely pure. Even the body, um, actually, I won't, I don't need to read the rest of that, but it's the idea that the body of a Buddha and a Buddha is not of this earth, not of this world, is transcendent. There's other points that unite the Mahasamgikas and the Lokotaravadins and the Ekavya Vaharikas. There's other points about, oh, you know, that the Buddha's voice completely fills the entire universe and like all of these really transcendent ideas. So that's what I want to talk about is this idea that seems to have been a part of the very earliest forms of Buddhism. And it's this idea that the Buddha 
a Buddha, that Buddhas are Lokotara, that they're transcendent. And this idea, by the way, that the that Buddhas are not from around here in that sense, that they're that they are transcendent, that idea basically becomes foundational for what will become Mahayana Buddhism. So what I'm getting at is, is that there was another group around the time of the Third Council called the Sarvastivadins, and they kind of split off during this time. And then there's also the Theravadins. They went by a different name then, back in those days, but they kind of started to split off too. So you kind of start to have this splitting off around this time, around 250 BC. Again, this is not because of the Third Council. The Third Council was actually just a gathering of all the different forms of Mahasamgika Buddhism, and then a weeding out of uh, people, individuals, who were kind of not up to par. But it was from that Third Council that we learned about all of these different forms of Mahasamgika Buddhism in that way, and then all of these different divergences. Mainly what's happening here, and this is what I want to talk about tonight, mainly what's happening here is there's this divergence happening between thinking of the Buddha as like, you know, the founder, the, the person, the human person, Siddhartha, who was just a person who was born like a, anybody else, lived a life, figured out this Dharma stuff, taught this Dharma stuff, and then passed away. And then they, we, they cremated him, took the little relic bones, gave everybody a little bone to remember the Buddha by, and then everybody went off in their own directions and worshipped little bone relics of the Buddha, physical remnants of the historical person. So there was that kind of idea about the Buddha. And of course, the Theravada tradition, parts of the Sarvastivadins, they leaned more towards the Buddha as just a human. But it was these other groups, mainstream Mahasamgikas, the Lokotaravadins, they had a different idea about the nature of a Buddha. And that, again, that way of thinking sort of becomes more of a Mahayana thing. One last thing before I forget. After the Third Council, Emperor Ashoka did something very interesting. He actually got together, and let me see, if I'll find the list. Yeah, he got together nine theras, nine elders. And these elders, these Buddhist monks, they, they had to have one um, uh, quality, a good memory. In fact, Ashoka is said to have found the nine elders who supposedly had memorized all of it, all the sutras, all the Vinaya, all the Abhidharma, that they were literally walking libraries. And then Ashoka took those nine elders who had memorized all the Dharma and sent them out in nine directions, sent them to uh, what is today Afghanistan, sent them to Egypt, sent them to Rome, sent them to the uh, Greek kind of Roman capital, sent them to China, sent them to Sri Lanka. So, and then sent them to other kind of Central Asian and other um, kind of more Western Indian regions. So Emperor Ashoka actually sent out these emissaries of Buddhism to spread the good word. And, one could, I won't, I won't bog you down with it tonight, 
but you can trace several of those um traditions meaning like the tradition that became prominent in afghanistan the the um the region that was known as gandhara gandhara that afghanistan region you might know of it at those giant uh buddha statues that were like carved into the mountains in afghanistan that the taliban blew up in around the year 2000 if you know of those big huge colossal buddha statues that are in afghanistan those were made by loka taravadin buddhists and so that is kind of a uh an insight into <laughs> Like, why are they building these giant Buddha statues? Like, what's up with that? Well, they didn't believe the Buddha was from here. They believed the Buddha was transcendent in that way. So apparently it was a group of Lokataravadins, again, Mahasamgika style, that Ashoka sent to Gandhara, sent to Afghanistan. And I was trying to find more information. Apparently it's of great interest. Uh, there are historians that want to know about that, that emissary that went to Egypt. Like, did Buddhism go to Egypt in the year 250 BC? Very interesting. I don't know. Can't tell you more, but. Okay, so that brings us full, uh, full speed. We're up to the third council. Any questions about this bunch of information I just dropped on you? <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I have two questions. Um, the first uh, you sort of answered, you said they, they don't know what happened to the emissaries in Egypt and what effect that had on Egyptian culture and history, if anything. Do they know about any of the other emissaries, like the one that went to Rome? Like, can you uh, kind of draw a line? Rome that? was another or... mystery. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And That's then fascinating. the more local ones, like in particular, the one that went to Sri Lanka, we know a lot about because Buddhism in Sri Lanka, be it became... Uh, uh, Sri Lanka became a stronghold for Buddhism. Uh, after yeah, I'm, I'm super curious about Buddhism's effect on other non-Buddhist, really, you know, places that are not currently Buddhist, but what effect did it have that, that these folks went to? But, but then my other question is, this is another class, I'm sure, but like, I, as soon as you started talking about Buddhas being transcendental, I thought, well, that sounds a lot like Mahayana. And, and then, and then you said, yes, indeed. But why, like, what is it about Buddhas being transcendental that led to the development of Mahayana Buddhism? Is there, do you, do you have an answer for that? Yep. Is it a whole class? <laughs> it is a whole class, but I'll give you the, the shorter version right now. I, I actually, as it, no, actually, as, as this has been going on, I've, as I've been telling you about all of this, there's been this other part of my mind that has been formulating a way to explain, like, how do we get to this transcendent idea of a Buddha to begin with? And so, yeah, and we will probably do talk a lot more about this idea, but I will give you kind of the basics. So, I mean, this is a tricky, tricky uh, question or just a qu tricky thing to talk about. The basic idea, though, is you kind of just need to consider some really basic Buddhist teachings that I've given you every Sunday night for months and years now. And the basic Buddhist teaching that you kind of need to consider is... <clears throat> It's the basic Buddhist teaching about what is called, well, it's the basic Buddhist teaching about what is called conditional phenomena and the nature of conditional phenomena. And by conditional, you know, we're talking about composite, temporary, joined together, conditional, relative, impermanent uh, for early Buddhist traditions, source of suffering. So all of this impermanent, constantly changing phenomena, which is everything. 
it's every object around you is impermanent, fleeting, ephemeral, conditional, relative. And even our own bodies and our own existence in that way is conditional, relative, impermanent, source of anxiety, suffering, all of that. So this should all sound pretty familiar to you if you've been coming to Dharma doors. And an aspect of the conditional realm, an aspect of the conditional realm, especially this body, bodily aspect of the conditional realm, one of the things that happens is, is that there is the formation of a deluded state of mind. And that deluded state of mind does something. It does a lot of things, but what it does is, is it, it does this kind of appropriating, this sort of um, mental grabbing and grasping and clinging in this way. It's part of what happens to this. And in other words, there's this sort of phenomena happening here. It gets confused, it gets diluted, and it goes, it's me. <laughs> this is me. This is me. This is mine. That's yours. And so there develops this kind of me and mine, you and yours, subject-object relationship, and eventually this sort of fabrication of a deluded sense of self a deluded, what we would call in modern jargon, an ego in that way. And it's utterly confused. It's utterly illusory. It doesn't take more than a few philosophical points to show that it's just utterly fabricated. And the basic idea, and again, I don't want to do a whole class about this, but the basic idea is that what makes a fully enlightened Buddha, a Buddha, is that they have realized this. And what that, and this is where it gets so tricky. It gets so tricky to talk about the nature of a Buddha because we are, I am, a conditional, deluded ego mind being. And you're telling me about. <laughs> a state that's not th this, that's not diluted mind state, all of that. And so from a lot of different points of the Dharma, we start to realize that a fully enlightened being, a Buddha, doesn't have anything to do with this. <laughs> It is other because what it means to be a suffering sentient being is to be feeling as if I'm in a body and feeling as if it's heavy and feeling as if I'm anxious and feeling all that's what it is to be a suffering sentient being. And a Buddha has transcended that. And therefore, the idea is, is that the uh, Buddha is not identifying with or as the physical body. Buddha is not identifying with or as an ego self being in that way. And so for lack of a better, for lack of better language, what we say is, is that Buddha is Lokotara, is not of the phenomenal realm at all, but kind of by definition, not by necessarily, not by necessarily sort of from by not being from earth or like not being from this realm. It's not that they're exactly saying that the Buddha is from somewhere else. They're just saying that a Buddha is not the same as a suffering sentient being and um, identifying with or as the physical body. Does that make sense, Noam? That kind of, is that a logical extent, like, does that make sense? Yeah, sort of. I think my question would take like a whole nother level, but it did help. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it was meant to help yeah. and not give the full picture. 
in that way. Okay, any other questions or ideas or comments about early Buddhism, council stuff, schism stuff? Okay, so that brings us to back to the sutra. Yeah, let, I mean, I'll dive back into the sutra and that'll probably start to help explain like what exactly why I'm talking about all of this. So one of the things, so what we're about to get into, by the way, is, oh, I totally forgot to tell you a very, very, very important part about the story of the councils. And I apologies for backtracking a little bit. Around the time of the third council, but actually this is something that starts to happen after the second council and around the time of the third council. So between around 300 BC and 250 BC, there are debates among the Mahasamgikas, particularly these Lokotaravadins I was telling you about. There was debate among these groups because some of them, the Lokotaravadins in particular, they wanted to bring into the canon the Mahayana Sutras. We don't know exactly what or which Mahayana Sutras they were talking about, but we know that there was this debate around this time brewing of these new sutras, what we call Mahayana Sutras. And there was a group that were like, yeah, these are the words of the Buddha. These are the words of the Buddha who's out of this world. So they should be brought into the canon. And there was still a more conservative part of the Mahasamgikas that were basically like, mm, nah, <laughs> we've already established what the sutras are. We don't need to add any new ones. And this division around including the Mahayana sutras or not seems to have been what started to divide the Mahasamgikas into what would become the Mahayana versus more mainstream monastic only forms of Buddhism. So I'm telling you that because in the more conservative forms of monastic Buddhism that survived, the Theravada tradition being the foremost among them who has survived into the modern world, there's a genre of literature that the early schools represented by the modern Theravada, there's a genre of literature that they're really into. And they the genre is called the Jataka tales. So Jatikas are this, a bunch of these collections of stories of the past lives of the Buddha. And it was in these stories about the past lives of the Buddha, it was the story about basically all of the lifetimes that led up to the being who was born as Siddhartha Gautama in 480 BC that would become the Buddha. And these Jataka tales are um, in, in like Thailand, and other parts of Southeast Asia where the Theravada tradition is really popular. Jataka tales are very popular among children. Parents, Buddhist parents teach them to their children because they're kind of like Aesop's fables or yeah, these kind of morality parables that use these stories of the previous lives of the Buddha, but to demonstrate various you know, virtues and qualities. So there's this kind of genre that deals with like how the Buddha became the Buddha, <clears throat> but it's all presented in a very, um, well, again, it's all presented in a way that the Buddha is a real person, like the historical Buddha is a real person and all of that. But what we're about to hear is the more Mahayana version of the Jataka tales. And this is going to be a little different. 
So if you have the, the yellow book, the Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, I'm over on page 443. Um, the Buddha is telling us about being a Buddha in that way. And in particular, we're learning about the upaya, the various upaya of the Buddha, the various skillful means. Now, this is coming right after the section I read last week. So I'm about midway through page 443. And the Buddha says to the bodhisattvas, says to everyone, when the bodhisattva, and this is re not referring to just a generic bodhisattva. This is referring specifically to the previous life of the Buddha. When the Buddha was a bodhisattva, a, a seeker of enlightenment. So when the bodhisattva, the Buddha, had fulfilled a past vow and was residing in the palace of the Tushita heaven, he could have attained supreme enlightenment and turned the Dharma wheel right then and there. However, he thought, while in the Toshita heaven, or while he was in the Toshita heaven, he thought, people in the world cannot ascend to this heavenly realm to hear the Dharma explained, while the gods can descend from the Toshita heaven to the world to hear the Dharma taught. Therefore, he left the Toshita heaven and attained supreme enlightenment in this world. This was an upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. So take care of my little cat for a second. Okay, so if you didn't know, it's a classic... It's a classic part of the story of the Buddha. Actually, it's a classic part of the story of all Buddhas, if you didn't know, that all Buddhas take their penultimate rebirth in the Tushita heaven, the heaven of extreme happiness. And then they descend to this world for their final rebirth. That's the way all Buddhas have done it. And they even say, if you didn't know, that the future coming Buddha named Maitreya, who's supposed to show up in thousands and thousands of years from now, but Maitreya is presently in the Toshita heaven, just waiting to come into the world. Now, what we hear here is this interesting backstory, which is that the Buddha, when he was up in the Toshita heaven, could have just achieved enlightenment and taught all the gods the dharma but then he thought oh but that's not fair because people can't make it up here whereas the gods can make it down to the world so i'm going to go down there and that's indeed exactly what he did now it's the next one that'll be interesting furthermore the buddha says after the Bodhisattva fulfilled a past vow by coming here from the Toshita heaven, he could have attained supreme enlightenment without entering his mother's womb. However, if he had not entered his mother's womb, sentient beings would have had their doubts, saying, where does the Bodhisattva come from? Is he a god? A naga? A ghost, a spirit, a Gandharava, or maybe a being produced by magic. If they had had such doubts, then they couldn't hear the Dharma explained or have devoted themselves to the Dharma practice in order to eradicate their suffering. Therefore, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva did not attain supreme enlightenment before entering his mother's womb. This was an upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. Okay, so now this is where I kind of want to 
open it up and start kind of having a broader conversation here. So that second one, so the Buddha is not going to just get enlightened in the Tushita to heaven. He's going to come kind of down to earth and teach us the Dharma. And he could have done it by not entering a womb, not being born by a woman. But then there's this interesting thing where it says, ah, but then people wouldn't have believed him. They would have had their doubts. They would have asked, you know, is he a God? Is he this or that? And so as in Upaya, as a skillful means, and they're going to use this language in a minute, but I'm going to use it now. The Buddha just appeared to enter his mother's womb. So now, I, I, again, I kind of want to open this up to a, a more interesting conversation. So you might have heard, or it might sound familiar to you, this whole like story about miraculous births of significant religious people. Of course, I'm thinking about kind of the Jesus mythology where, you know, Jesus is born miraculously, not by like a normal form of procreation, but kind of a, a more divine form of procreation where the Mary is just pregnant in that way. Same thing happens with the Buddha. His mother just has a dream. We're going to hear about it in a second. But she just has a dream and the Buddha enters into her side. And there's no copulation. There's no sexuality. It's a miraculous conception. I don't have any final statements or any final, you know, final things to say about what any of that means. But I do find it very interesting that in this very kind of pretty ancient um, form of Buddhism, this Loka Taravadanism, they were already dealing with this idea of the Buddha not really having been pro been conceived the way you and I were conceived, not really having been born the way we were born. And, you know, as many of you know, I come at, I began my study of Buddhism as a professor of religion. So I was teaching courses about all kinds of religions. I was even doing comparative religion. And so I have a part of my mind that is interested in comparative religion that is interested in, oh, look, they're doing this over here and they're doing the same thing over here. Isn't that interesting? So I am very interested in this kind of mythologizing of like the Jesus story, the Buddha story. There's a lot of parallels in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, there's a lot of um, kind of historians, anthropologists, um, scholars of religion, you know, and a lot of them say, oh, you know, that's just mythologizing. It's to, it's to make Jesus or the Buddha significant. Like it's a way, it's a mythological way of saying that they were extraordinary people. Yeah, I, I, I get that argument. I understand that kind of approach to that idea. I understand that approach to mythology. I don't really think it goes as that as far as it could in that way in terms of respecting the philosophy or respecting the teachings in that sense because there's a lot of deep philosophy to I tried to explain a little bit of it a moment ago. I know I didn't even come close. But there's some really interesting teachings or again philosophy about this idea about sort of a way of talking about the buddha or a way of talking about jesus or whoever so this is sort of now creating in this sutra we are creating a kind of a different narrative about the life of the buddha and again what we're doing is is we are removing 
the Buddha as a historical human and putting the Buddha more in this kind of other realm in that way. And I leave it up to you to, of course, I leave everything up to you in that way, but I leave it up to you to decide like, which is like, which are, is an upaya for you. And what I mean by it, what I mean by that is, are you the type of person where you want to have um, just a human founder of a religion? Like, are, is that upaya for you to hear that the Buddha was just a person, just a regular old person, and nothing really particularly special except for getting enlightened? But, you know, is that appealing to you or... Are you the type of person that doesn't really particularly want to worship another human being? <laughs> Are you the type of person that, that doesn't want to pedestal another human being? And does it make, is it more effective for you? Is it more of an upaya for you for the Buddha to be transcendent? So that when you are engaged in a relationship with Buddha or even Buddhism, that you are engaged with this uh, transcendence in that way, something transcendent. Again, you know, I don't, I'm not here to say which is obviously not here to say which is true or not, but it also not here to say which is beneficial or not or anything like that. But they're two very different kind of approaches to the Buddha. Again, either just a human or something transcendent different approaches to the Buddha, but then if you take one of those ways, it becomes a different approach to Buddhism. And what I mean by that, and now let me digress. I mentioned that I used to teach comparative religion, but of course my, un, my graduate study, my undergraduate study, we, I did a lot of studying of early Christianity more in my undergraduate years. But if you've studied early Christianity, you'll know that Christianity went through the same exact thing, which was there was one group of Christians over here that were saying, no, no, no. Jesus was just a Jewish carpenter, just a human Jewish carpenter, and basically just a wise uh, prophet at best. Then you got this group over here saying, no, 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 Jesus was the son of God. Jesus was transcendent. And then, of course, Catholicism sort of settles in this sort of middle zone where they, they kind of get to have it both ways, where like Jesus was sort of son of God and, and human at the same time. It kind of theologically gets confusing. If you know your history of Christianity, there were schisms. Uh, Valentinius and these other Gnostic Christians who basically were espousing loco tara vaden Christianity. <laughs> they were talking about how Jesus was utterly transcendent, had nothing to do with blood, flesh, was not, this was all, um, what's the word, docetic. It was all an illusion. It was all an appearance. That actually sounds very familiar. It's literally what we're about to read from this, which was that all of this, the Buddha being born, the Buddha teaching, the Buddha getting enlightened, it was all just a magic show we're about to hear. And there were groups of Christians in the early days who felt the same way about Jesus, that even the crucifixion dying on the cross, it was all just a magic show that God put on for humans <laughs> again i'm not here to say which is which or what what is what but very interesting that these two major religious traditions both in terms of their theology goes through this kind of difference and then in terms of schisms within the various organizations they go in these two different directions just a human versus transcendent. Okay, any questions about the idea of uh, human, transcendent, any of that stuff? Cool.
Cool. Um, by the way, I will add this to that uh, little conversation really quickly. It does seem, just to go back to early Christianity, by the way, and I know not everybody's interested, you're here for Buddhism, but I know some people are interested in comparative religion. It's interesting to note that very early Christianity, and I'm talking like pre-Catholic church, so like the first few hundred years before the Catholic church became dominant, there were some Christians for whom Jesus and the, the story of Jesus all the way to the crucifixion, there were some for whom that, the life of Jesus, it was to be replicated. That like, it was a model for how to be a human and how to transcend the human state was to be like Jesus. But then as these different doctrines and teachings about Jesus as human, not so much, son of God, more, 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 you get this sort of slow, and sometimes it's not that slow, but this slow shift to, no, 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 no. Don't be like Jesus, worship Jesus. <laughs> You don't get, you can't be Jesus. Jesus is the son of God for crying out loud. So you don't be like Jesus. You pray to Jesus. You worship Jesus. And that's an interesting kind of uh, thing that goes on where as a human, it's, there's this idea of like, well, then I can do the thing Jesus did. But as soon as they're more divine, it becomes more of an object of worship. That does happen in Buddhism. However, it's a little different because there's sort of within all forms of Buddhism, Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana, within all schools of Buddhism, you are always being encouraged to become awakened. <laughs> you are always being encouraged to you know, maybe in some schools you can't be a Buddha, but you can definitely do like the lifestyle and practice that the, in fact, you should do the lifestyle and the practice that the Buddha did to at least achieve a state of liberation. You might not be able to achieve a state of Buddhahood. The Mahayana tradition thinks you can achieve a state of Buddhahood, whereas the more, some of the more Hinayana Theravada you can get liberated, but you can't be a Buddha in that way. Okay, so differences in, the, in doctrine or dif differences in the teachings lead to differences in practice. So I just wanted to point that out. Let's just read a couple more of the Buddha's upaya. So furthermore, Do not say that the Bodhisattva, the Buddha, really stayed in the womb of his mother. Do not think so. <laughs> Why? Because the Bodhisattva Mahasattva actually did not enter his mother's womb. How so? Because the Bodhisattva had entered the undefiled dhyana meditation while in the Toshita heaven. He remained in that dhyana meditation when he descended from the Toshita heaven, all the way up until the time when he sat under the Bodhi tree. The gods in the Toshita heaven thought that the, that the Bodhisattva's life had come to an end and that he would not again return to that heavenly realm. But actually, he remained unmoved in that meditative state, in that heavenly realm the whole time. He appeared to enter the womb of his mother. He appeared to enjoy the five sensuous pleasures. He appeared to leave the household life. He appeared to practice austerities. All sentient beings took these things to be real, but to the Bodhisattva, 
These were just a magical display. The Bodhisattva entered the womb of his mother, amused himself with sensual pleasures, left the household life, and practiced austerities. But all these were just a magical display. Why? The Bodhisattva was pure in conduct. He did not enter the womb, and so on, because he had renounced all those worldly actions long ago. This was the upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. Okay, so that sort of clear, that kind of is what I was just talking about, that it was all just a magical display. It was all just a show for us in that way. Interesting. The Buddha the whole time was just in a meditative state up in the Tushita heaven. It was all just a, an appearance down here. I'll give you another one. And why did the Bodhisattva appear to enter his mother's womb in the form of a white elephant, which is part of the story that Maya, the Buddha's mother, had a dream that a white elephant with six tusks came flying into her right side. So why did the Bodhisattva appear to enter his mother's womb in the form of a white elephant? Because throughout or within this billion-fold world universe, the Bodhisattva was the most venerable of beings. Having achieved such white, pure dharmas, he appeared to enter the womb in the form of a white elephant. No god, no human ghost or spirit could have entered a womb in this same way. This was in Upaya, practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. And, and, and by the way, the reason why I did want to go through this I wanted to go through this section because some of you may have not heard of all of these. So like the story of the white elephant with the six tusks, that's a classic part of the Jataka tales. That's a classic part of how the Buddha came to be with us. But this is an interesting Mahayana Upaya twist on all of these. So we're kind of doing two things at once. If you haven't heard these kind of significant moments of the life of the Buddha, then we're hearing about these kind of significant moments, but we're also sort of hearing them explored in a different way, this uh, Mahayana Upaya way. So let me just give you one more. The question, and why did the Bodhisattva stay in his mother's womb for a full 10 months? before being born. And that is the story about actually not just the Buddha, but actually many sages, many Indian rishis, Indian wise people. There's a story that they all spend one extra month in the womb. They're all born after 10 months rather than nine. And so why did the Bodhisattva stay in his mother's womb for 10 months? Some sentient beings might think if the child does not stay in his mother's womb for a full 10 months, his body may not be fully developed. Therefore, the Bodhisattva appeared to stay in his mother's womb for a full 10 months. During this period of time, gods often came close to, close to the mother to show respect for the Bodhisattva and made circumambulations around him. Once, the gods saw the Bodhisattva living in a high tower, surpassing even those of the gods, beautifully adorned with the seven treasures. Seeing this auspicious sign, 24,000 gods generated bodhicitta. This was all just an upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. Actually, I'll, I want to read this next one because it's still in the, the same vein of miraculous birth and birth stories. I found this one very interesting. Um, I know somebody 
will inevitably ask me, wait a minute, when was this sutra written after I read you this? So I'll tell you, we don't exactly know when this sutra was written, um, but there's probably a good chance that it's from the maybe the first century of the common era. The ideas that we're talking about, as I've mentioned, might even go back much further, but definitely probably I'd say first century, second century common era. So the question is, and why did the Bodhisattva enter? Why did the Bodhisattva enter the womb of his mother through her right side? I just mentioned the white elephant in the dream came into her right side. That's how she got uh, impregnated. So why did that happen? Well, the Buddha says some sentient beings might doubt. And they might say, the Bodhisattva is born from a combination of the father's sperm and the mother's egg cell. In order to resolve their doubt and to manifest a miraculous birth, the Bodhisattva entered the womb of his mother through her right side. Though he entered her body through the side, he really entered no place at all. Queen Maya experienced then a physical and mental joy that she had never experienced before. This was an upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. All right, so that gets us all through the, um, well, next up, we're going to get to the miraculous, the actual birth, and that'll lead us in next week, we're going to talk about some aspects of the kind of the life story of the Buddha, like the kind of the early years of the Buddha. But I did just want to share that one with you. I thought that one was very interesting for such an ancient text to not only be acknowledging the science of how um, how birth happens or how a conception happens through egg and sperm coming together, but then interesting to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Buddha wasn't born that way. The Buddha was born in this miraculous way, which again is sort of a theme throughout a lot of religious traditions that why sagely people are born miraculously. Okay, questions, comments, answers, ideas about any of this, criticisms of any of this, it totally, you know, always with Dharma doors, we're here to critique as we, as we are just as much to praise. Everybody have any thoughts about all of this? All right. Well, then that'll conclude uh, tonight's uh, little lesson and some early schools of Buddhism and some of the uh, Buddhist mythology. Um, that's going to do it for me. Gnome, I'm going to pass it over to you.